Hello, I'm Dr. Sean Williams and welcome to Play Your Part, a programme by ITN Business and Mental Health UK. Now, whatever your role in society, we all have a unique contribution to play when it comes to the future of mental health. And this programme will showcase the changing conversations and interventions being implemented in the workplace the effect of the cost of living crisis, and we'll also explore how we can maintain our own mental health as well as that of those around us. I'm joined now by Brian Dow, Chief Executive of Mental Health UK. Hello, Brian. Hi, Sean. Uh, tell us first about the societal issues that are currently affecting people's mental health. Well, we've been talking at Mental Health UK for a number of years now about how we shouldn't see the issue of mental health in isolation. There are so many other factors that affect our mental health, our, our, our housing, our, our finances, how connected we are with our friends and family. And of course, along comes the global pandemic and proves that truth horribly so because, of course, not only do people have kind of serious problems with their money, they were worried about losing their jobs, they got really disconnected from their fam families. And of course, throughout that process, the pressure on people's mental health was profound. And quite rightly, the government made sure that in all of its decisions about furloughing, about people's uh, you know, situations personally, about whether or not the vaccine would move at what speed, mental health was at the center of that. And that was absolutely right, because you cannot see mental health as a thing that exists over here, separate from everything else in your life. Now, you mentioned financial issues and of course everybody's thinking about the cost of living crisis and how that is going to directly impact mental health. What do you think the long-term consequences of that might be? Well I think the long-term consequences of it could be very very profound if we don't see the right level of action from the government because what you're beginning to see over the last two or three months when this is suddenly um, hove into view is the pressure that people are feeling is actually beginning to show up through the health system. So if you take our own mental health and money advice service, the number of people who've called us over the last couple of months has doubled. The amount of debt that people are in because of their gas and electricity bill has doubled. Mm. And that is going to trickle through to your GP, potentially people in more serious trouble. So I think we have to think very seriously about the level of support and intervention that people get, because if we don't, that's going to show up as pressure somewhere else in the system, and we don't want that. No. What I've noticed, I guess, is that a lot of companies are now taking the mental health of their employees, their, their customers, the wider society, a lot more seriously, and they're doing a lot more. What have you noticed, and what impact can that have? Well, we spend so much of our time at work, and of course, work can keep us well, because, you know, it provides us with a social fabric. Uh, we, we get our income from work, and we meet lots of friends, and hopefully move up uh, through our lives. But what can also make us unwell? If you're in a toxic environment with a manager that really doesn't care about you and is, is, is perhaps bullying you, that can create a spiral. So I think a lot of companies over the last 10 years or so have begun to realize that just in the same way that we made incredible progress around the question of physical health and importantly, the health and safety agenda at work, mm. if you're not doing the same thing with mental health, then you're not only perhaps putting pressure on your employees, but it really will affect your bottom line as well. Because of course, mental health is the single big, biggest factor in absenteeism mm -hmm. and presenteeism. So actually, workplaces don't really have a choice, they've got to get with the agenda. There are things we can do as individuals. What advice would you give to, to anyone looking for, for some self-care tips, things to look after themselves? Well, I think there's four things. The first is the sort of prevention bit. So, you know, having a, a good diet, sleeping well, making sure that you are you know, connected in with your social group um, and so on, things like that, the kind of prevention, the, the basics. Then what do you do if you become unwell or you suspect you're unwell? And of course that's seek help, talk about it. Mm. The change we've seen in the stigma around mental health helps a great deal. I would also kind of encourage people who are thinking about mental health and there is some evidence that's becoming one of the most important things in terms of the public's voting um, intentions is that perhaps people might want to join the professions, you know, lots of opportunities. And I, and I would say that, you know, as well as being individuals, we are all citizens. And I think what we need to do is demand change from government that the investment that goes into mental health really meets the, the need that's developed over the last few years. Brian Dow, thanks very much.
Also. We're all thinking of the cost of living crisis and our mental health can be impacted if we're worrying about our finances. A mental health and money advice service set up by Mental Health UK has seen a significant rise in users in recent months. We went to Edinburgh to find out more. More than half a million people call Edinburgh home. The Scottish capital has one of the highest average incomes of any city in the UK. But even here, the rising cost of living is leaving its residents worried about the winter ahead. Wages aren't going up and people are going on strike. Um, when about a third of students have less than £50 a month um, to, to spend as disposable income. I think people um, kind of develop an attitude of apathy because it's the only way that they can cope. So there's a lot of like despondency and hopelessness. As the cost of living continues to rise in the UK, everything from transport to food and drink has risen. And so many people are struggling to make ends meet. That's why organisations like Mental Health UK are doing all they can to help. But they say demand for their services has risen by more than double in the last six months. Mental Health and Money Advice, Alex speaking. How can I help? Alex is one of Mental Health UK's highly skilled advisors. Her clients are not only affected financially, but they're also tackling depression and anxiety. Now, we are facing that kind of crisis where people who were, they could be getting quite a, a good wage, but again, that wage isn't, isn't covering the everyday, everyday bills and they just don't know where to start. Mental Health UK are seeing a surge in referrals for their services, where they help people with money problems and also support their well-being. I do have a few clients who, again, they are reaching out to get help with their energy bills. They may not be in a crisis with that bill at the moment, but they are terrified, and that's quite a common theme that I do see. Leading the Mental Health and Money Advice Service through this demanding time is Laura Peters. She is acutely aware of the pressures her staff are facing and their clients. So 81% of our clients see an improvement in their well-being um, once they've had an interaction with us and that's something I'm really, really proud of, that actually we're improving people's mental health as well as helping them solve their money problem. Someone whose life was changed by Mental Health UK is Dawn, who has been a carer for her husband and her parents. She was referred to mental health and money advice by their local charity partner, Support in Mind Scotland. Literally, everything was getting on top of me. Um, didn't know how to cope with it um, and it was just one thing after another and I just broke down in the doctors and they said they were going to get me some support. If you talk to somebody like Support and Mind, they can help you in every single way and if they can't help you, they'll find some help for you. I see them as friends as well as them helping me. It, I think to myself, if I didn't have this help um, and I didn't talk about what, what I was going through, um, no, I wouldn't be here now. For Laura and her team, maintaining this level of support for the UK's most vulnerable during this difficult economic time is crucial. I'd really uh, like organisations to know um, that we are here, we are looking for funding um, and if um, they have customers that might benefit from our support then really it is incumbent on them to kind of say that yes, mental health and money advice needs to exist. Mental Health UK added that talking about the problems so many are facing is the first step to getting help and their friendly expert advisors are just a call away. The importance of good mental health is increasingly being recognised by employers in this post-pandemic world. The professional services company Accenture has a long-established employee wellbeing programme and has been working to create a culture which encourages open and honest conversations. Feeling your voice is heard in the workplace is good for staff and good for managers. It's the top-down approach taken at Accenture. I've expressed on leadership calls that the last few years have occasionally sent me sideways, right? And when you hear that at the top level, it makes a difference. And an acceptance there often isn't a clear line between people's personal and professional lives. Way more conversation and people being prepared to say, I'm feeling tired, I'm run down, I'm not feeling right. 
Now, in our world and in the business world, that was something you kind of didn't say. But people aren't seeing it that way, and they're seeing it now as a bit of a sign of strength, uh, that, you know, resilience is hard and I'm open. Alex started working at Accenture at a difficult time in her life. Tragically, my brother took his own life. And when I joined, I was really in need of support myself. So I heard about the mental health ally training and I went along and there's an opportunity to listen to other people's experiences during the training. And I realized that I wasn't alone by listening to other people's experiences. To try and normalize discussions around well-being, Accenture has almost three and a half thousand health allies in the UK and Ireland. It's part of a range of services that are available. We've got our 24-7 helpline uh, that anyone can phone at any time to give access to counselling and therapy services. In our offices we offer wellbeing consultations and digitally we offer all sorts of support tools to help people with things like mindfulness, sleeping um, and all sorts of specialist um, areas like breathing techniques and that kind of thing. More people are talking about life stresses but not enough. Discussing openly how we feel perhaps may prevent a mental health crisis later in life. A mental health ally could be a colleague, someone you're familiar with who's ready to listen and perhaps notice any telltale signs that something isn't right. Things that you can start to notice are people who are normally punctual showing up late to work, somebody who would normally come for a team outing, not being there, someone being more withdrawn than usual, maybe someone that's very chatty. The first time I struggled with depression, I remember talking to my manager about it and she said to me, I understand what you're going through. And I thought, great. And then the next thing that came out of her mouth was, but don't bring it into work. Um, you wouldn't encounter that situation there. I lead our yoga club for the UK and I think yoga as a physical practice as well as a mental practice has, is a real tool to addressing and being preventative with mental health issues. In Accenture, mental health allies are a safety net to listen and support other staff who feel vulnerable. It's a foundation the company hopes to build on and expand long into the future. There is a huge demand for mental health services in the UK. As well as visiting your local in-store Boots pharmacist, you can now access a collection of online mental health services that offer a range of free and paid for tools and treatments. The help, advice and support now include talking therapy and, if appropriate, access to prescription medicines too. Here's more from Nottingham. According to the World Health Organization, the pandemic triggered a 25% increase in anxiety and depression worldwide. It's been a wake-up call for organizations to step up their mental health support. Pharmacists were more accessible than most healthcare professionals during COVID and saw a huge surge in demand for their services. Yeah. Heather Blandford is one of nearly 7,000 Boots pharmacists. She's worked for the company for more than two decades. Heather and her colleagues have seen their role expand over the last couple of years and are helping customers navigate their way through the healthcare system like never before. We've seen a big uptick in patients who are more aware of their mental health and mental well-being and as a result of that are able to talk about it more, but that's not everyone. Some patients really don't feel comfortable talking about their mental health and mental well-being. So actually for us having the ability to ask open questions and be there for them, we can often unlock some um, op opportunities for patients to take the next step in terms of helping them to feel better. Where appropriate, Boots pharmacists can signpost customers seeking mental wellness support to the Boots Health Hub, where they can access, among other things, the Boots Online Doctor, a private service that can offer eligible patients who meet certain criteria treatment for anxiety and depression. Once you've entered the Boots Online Doctor website, you fill out a comprehensive questionnaire, then you have a clinician consultation, and following that, you work collaboratively on a treatment plan, which could include talking therapies, prescription medication, and also tips for your general mental well-being. We've had fantastic feedback from patients. It's a growing service, which we all really enjoy working in, and the clinicians find it really rewarding helping as many people as we can.
How important is it to you that you can identify people now who might be experiencing mental health issues? So it may be just a simple conversation, just to check in how they are, or just have a have a little chat about the dog, the family, and so on and so forth. We have a lot of patients that do that with us, versus other patients we've never seen before that see us as a first port of call that they can come to for advice in a particular scenario that they're facing in their lives right now. For patients to know that we are there, we are accessible, and quite often we are trading, you know, across the weekend and to fit around people's working pattern as well is really important. Boots pharmacists are on the front line, offering a one-stop shop, helping, supporting, signposting with simple, effective advice. People can reach our service very easily, very quickly, and they can message us when they need help in addition to the regular reviews that they have. We also have patients who come to us in their hour of need, and we are there and able to help them in terms of what they need right there, right then, to suit their needs. Boots, evolving every day and helping to manage the increase in demand for mental health services, where patients from a wide range of demographics can make contact at any time throughout the UK. Reaching out for help with your mental health is important, but it can be a challenging first step for some, especially in the workplace. To help remove the stigma around mental health, Deutsche Bank has implemented a wellbeing strategy that offers education, support and guidance for their staff. So I used to get on the train and the closer I got to work, the, the tears would start to fall. But then when I walked through the doors, I sort of put a mask on. In 2018, Adele was feeling overwhelmed. She was a single mum in a bad relationship and was struggling to manage these challenges in addition to her job at Deutsche Bank, to the point she started to avoid friends, colleagues and even work meetings. It was only when she opened up to one of the bank's mental health first aiders, staff trained to spot and support colleagues who may be suffering with mental health issues, that she realised she needed help. A lot of tears. Um, and he just let me talk. So he just listened and at the end of it, he said, would you like me to tell you how many times you've just called yourself stupid? So it makes me get a bit upset. Um, just having somebody to listen and to validate how I felt was just fantastic. Adele found support through the bank's employee assistance programme, where she was offered psychotherapy and agreed a plan with her manager to support her recovery. Over the next year, Adele gradually felt better, to the point she volunteered to train as one of the bank's 350 global mental health first aiders. Historically in banking, discussing mental health issues has always been a sign of weakness. But research shows that if leaders are willing to open up, it can help everyone. Fabrizio was left devastated when a close colleague and friend died unexpectedly. As a leader, he felt he had to be strong, but inside he was struggling to cope. And that opened up a, um, a, a very big uh, emotional crisis in me. It really exposed me to my fears. It exposed me to um, a sense of uh, anxiety and, and a very depressive state. I, I realized I was not uh, myself. Um, and it happened suddenly. Uh, I felt I could cope with it. I had to provide leadership to my team who were going through the same grief as I was. But I wasn't able to provide all that leadership. Fabrizio realised he needed to do something about it and now practices meditation as a coping mechanism to manage different challenges in life. He's passionate about making sure the bank supports those in need. So hi everyone. Um, thank you so much for joining today um, to our Wellbeing Forum. At these regular wellbeing forums, staff across the bank exchange self-care tips and advice on mental health and wellbeing. The bank also offers a global mental health awareness e-learning course for all staff, from new joiners to divisional leaders, to learn how to better take care of themselves and others. Mental health is something you cannot uh, leave at home. Uh, you bring it with yourself all the time. It's, it's who you are. And often there was a sense that uh, you needed to hide it. Um, and the point is, just like we cannot hide a broken arm when we come into the office, we shouldn't feel compelled to hide our changes to our own mental well-being. It's who we are. 
Lee is the CEO of MQ Mental Health Research, the largest mental health research charity in the UK. The bank's employees chose to support MQ for two years through the award-winning Charity of the Year programme. The packed calendar of fundraising events aims to raise two million for the charity, as well as utilising the skills of the bank, including a 24-hour global hackathon where IT staff can develop a prototype mental health app based on groundbreaking MQ-funded research. So I met with the top leadership team of Deutsche Bank in the UK uh, and heard from them about the investment they've made over the last four years. I've seen senior executives talking about their mental health openly. I've heard staff saying that they've been able to take time out for their mental health and their career has still moved forward. So I think all that proves that Deutsche Bank is serious about the mental health of its staff. With professional support from friends, family and colleagues, Adele has returned to work feeling much happier. I just feel a bit more maybe optimistic that, you know, life is good. Um, I am a good parent. Um, I am a good, good dog owner <laughs> and I do a good job as well for the bank and I think it's just telling myself that um, and believing it that is, it is important. As working practices evolve post-pandemic to encompass a hybrid model, there's ever more awareness of the importance of a workplace culture which facilitates good mental health. HSBC has long recognised the benefits of mindfulness in fostering positive relationships and good practice with a well-established programme of training for its employees. Staff at HSBC's global IT hub in Sheffield take time out of the office to join a mindfulness session led by one of their colleagues, Mary. If it feels okay, maybe we'll take our awareness more fully onto the out-breath for a little while now. Employees at HSBC have pioneered an in-house mindfulness programme which has been so popular amongst staff that it's now been rolled out globally across the organisation. The programme has grown organically from the grassroots up and it all started here in Sheffield. I came across mindfulness in my 20s and it was really in response to panic attacks. When I joined HSBC um, I felt that it would be something that might be really useful for other colleagues to practice and so I started to run some sessions uh, which went really well in Sheffield. We expanded that out and before we knew it we had demand across the UK. Meanwhile, the UK Chief Information Officer had also been practising mindfulness to reduce headaches, and it was working. Along with HR, they gained support from senior management and empowered the employees to further develop it. In 2019, it became a fully-fledged mindfulness programme, sponsored by the group COO, and it's now spread throughout the entire organisation, not just in the UK, but in the bank's network all over the world. The feedback that we're getting on this programme from our colleagues in other countries is incredible. This has been designed by our employees and it's been scaled out by our employees across the bank. Um, it's got in industry insights, so from either peer companies or specialist mindfulness companies, they've all contributed as well. And the third thing is it's supported by an app infrastructure as well to help colleagues get simple and quick access to this type of information. Since 2017, HSBC has noticed a 30% reduction in stress levels amongst staff who have taken the mindfulness programme. So it's no surprise that it's gaining in popularity and they're now running some 40-odd sessions a week globally. In fact, the government-sponsored all-party parliamentary group on mindfulness, which Jamie helps to run, has recognised HSBC with an innovation award. Crucially, they focus on high-quality, evidence-based mindfulness training. And the other in in interesting thing they've done here is develop a kind of community or ecosystem approach, which means that champions of mindfulness, those who have really felt the benefit in their own lives, are empowered and trained up to share it with others in the organisation. Kate initially started practising after a period of time off work due to stress. Fortunately for me, there was someone in our building at work that started offering mindfulness sessions at lunchtime. It really um, helped me to manage my stress, started sleeping better, 
and I really wanted to share that. The Champions programme started with about 30 of us um, on a training programme and then from then we started delivering workshops and sessions to people. We've kind of now uh, delivered the training out globally to people in different countries, in different languages. We now have about 120 um, champions that are trained. Mindfulness can really change the way that our brains operate. So we have something called neuroplasticity and neuroplasticity really talks to how our brains are able to change through our lives on a daily basis. And when you do sustained repeated mindfulness, it, that's exactly what it does. It changes your brain. So it's not just that you feel better, it's that your brain has changed. So the way that you think about things is different. HSBC's high standards for the quality of the mindfulness teaching that they give their staff is setting a precedent. They are the first organisation to apply for accreditation from the British Association of Mindfulness-Based Approaches. Applying for accreditation means that they're very open, they're, they want people to come and see what they're doing and to, and, and to judge it by its own merits. And they're proud, they want, to show, they want to show the world. We get testimonials back that just say what a huge difference this has made to somebody's day, to somebody's literal moment, and to somebody's um, you know, working life, home life, and the ripple effect into their worlds as well. Um, you know, it's, 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 it's a wonderful thing to see. The need for mental health support is reaching unprecedented levels and individuals are often faced with long waiting lists for effective treatment. Psyomics recognises the need for care to be provided at a much faster rate and have developed a digital assessment designed to alleviate pressure on NHS workforces and get more people the support they need faster. One of the first full rollouts of Psyomics is taking place here at the Hertfordshire Partnership University NHS Foundation Trust. It's known for its innovative approach in using technology to help support its mental health professionals. David has completed the Psyomics online assessment that will give mental health clinicians a first insight into the issues he's been facing a process that would usually take up to two hours face to face. Filling out this detailed assessment before their appointment means the clinician can be steps ahead when they meet and already have an idea about the best options for support. This is going to be a great initiative uh, for, from the service users and carers point of view because um, they are not going to wait for that long for initial assessment. So that was the first thing uh, we thought uh, which, which would benefit our services and carers. And then uh, uh, the amount of information which is generated and including some kind of um, algorithms used within the digital document, we are not completely relying on that in terms of the pointers towards diagnosis. That in itself is quite uh, a positive uh, development. The effects of waiting for mental health treatment can be damaging. One in four people experience a mental health problem every year, and there are currently up to 1.6 million people waiting for support. Almost 40% of these said that waiting for treatment had led to a further decline in their mental health. The mental health professionals providing care also need support to help those in need. There is a great need for mental health services to embrace technology to help the professionals working in these services provide support to all the people who need it. The volume of patients coming to the NHS, for instance, has increased exponentially. The volume of clinicians has not increased at the same rate and the NHS hasn't got bucket loads of spare money to train people either. So really, it has to turn to technology to help. Most people go to their GPs with mental health problems. The GP then has to make a referral to a mental health assessment and treatment service. The hope is that a digital assessment like Psyomics will help to speed things up and get patients into the right treatment for their needs at the earliest opportunity. So if the questionnaire collects this information and then I see the patient, I will not have to go with them through it, note it all down and then type it, um, but it, that will have been collected and then I can sit with the patient and talk to them about the things that really sort of are important to, to the person. Innovation is seen as the way forward to help meet the needs of both patients and clinicians, 
as well as address some of the challenges with waiting lists in the NHS. What Xiaomi Solution allows us to do is to give our service users the option to tell us their story at a time and a place of their cho choosing. At the moment, they have to do this at the initial assessment, which can at times be stressful for the service user. We think that this approach will not only improve the quality of our initial assessments, but ultimately um, save time to our clinicians and service users, which means this time can be reinvested in time to care to help us see more service users and help more service users, ultimately helping us to meet some of the increased demand we're seeing following the pandemic. When a patient sits in front of me, they have not seen me before. It's sometimes quite intimidating as well to be asked all these personalised questions about your innermost feelings. So here they will have had the time to do it in their own time. I will see it and then we can discuss it and they can be hopefully feel more at ease um, about it as well. Within the workplace, individuals may experience stress or pressures from their role, which can take a toll on their mental well-being. Schroders, a leading global investment manager, has implemented an innovative data-led approach to well-being, putting tailored interventions in place to encourage a happy, healthy and valued workforce. I've basically had various different kinds of mental illness since I was about 14. It's just so difficult to get a diagnosis. But a couple of years ago, after the first time I was in hospital, I had a diagnosis of bipolar type 2. Lucy's struggles with chronic mental illness have taken her on a difficult and complicated journey. She's not alone in this experience. But at Schroeder, she has had the confidence to open up with colleagues and get the support she needs. They've been amazing. Um, access to doctors, health insurance, all of those sorts of things have been really, really fantastic. But also it's been the conversations I've been able to have with managers um, and colleagues as well. Awareness and training programmes for managers and mental health first aiders ensure that colleagues are equipped to look out for one another. We want people like Lucy to stay with the business because they can contribute so much. It creates a culture which I think engenders loyalty. And a part of that is enabling people to feel that they can bring themselves to work, they can talk frankly about their problems. Schroders is a global investment management company with more than 200 years of history but it's still finding new ways to look after its most precious asset, its employees. Back in 2015 was the first time we launched a wellbeing strategy. And at that point in time, we realised we offer a lot of benefits already, you know, gym and health insurance and all of this. But we wanted to elevate what we were offering, not just to help people when they're unwell, but really elevate it to allow them to proactively um, remain fit, healthy and, and happy with us. Schroders has a wide range of well-being support. Events, a resource group, an on-site therapist, a hotline for employees and their families. And support for all this comes right from the very top. One of my team received a phone call years ago, uh, back in 2016, from Peter Harrison, our chief executive, saying, mental well-being is something that's really important to me, it's really important to this firm, how can I help you accelerate what we're doing in this area? And where are you taking it next? You've obviously come a long way, but what does the future hold? What we've seen is you can provide everything at a headline level, but well-being is so personal. Mental health is so personal. It's not one size fits all. So actually we need to have the tools to get and the data to be way more sophisticated in identifying where there's an issue, what might be the cause of that issue, and really going in with tailored um, support in those circumstances. And Schroders is already making strides in this direction. Well, we focus on the most accessible and advanced technology, which is heart rate variability. The company has been conducting research based on the Human Sustainability Index, a data and technology-led method for assessing and improving well-being and resilience. So when you marry the data from a heart rate monitor with a whole life assessment revealing the contexts behind those physiological reactions, then you build up an amazingly detailed picture of how people respond to all of life's challenges and how they can become more resilient. But what this did is looked at kind of 
the wider person, like the whole human being, and recognising that what they're doing at home affects what they do at work. And so if you can support people more broadly, then they'll hopefully be stronger as a result, more resilient as a result. 96% of employees say they are proud to work for Schroders, so its tailored wellbeing strategy is clearly working. Schroders empowers people to get the support they need when they need it and proactively invest in their own well-being too. Ongoing openness, conversation and innovation allow businesses like Schroders to play their part in building a society which better supports mental wellness. Mental health affects us all. So the importance of addressing mental health concerns, whether in daily life or at work, is imperative for people not to feel ostracised. The Walt Disney Company, UK and Ireland, say they've made it their mission to better engage their employees around mental health through offering practical support, building inclusive policies and investing in training. Providing time and space for people to talk is making a real difference at Disney. This entertainment giant is supporting everyone's mental health and well-being by embedding the discussion into its corporate culture. Feeling that we work within an environment where talking about mental health is normal, it's not stigmatised, that's really important. Mental health, it's often invisible. And for that reason, you don't know if somebody's struggling. And I think given we spend so much time at work with our work families, we have to look out for each other. We've got to look out for our staff. Trust is a business employee-led resources group, or BERG, and an acronym for the company's mission statement around mental health. Encouraging people to talk so they can recognise, understand and support one another, so everyone can triumph. We create a safe space for our employees, which we refer to as our cast members. We create that safe space so they can feel like they can open up and talk freely about any kind of mental health problems that they might be dealing with. Ever since the kind of pandemic, is something that people have had to really think about in terms of their mental health. And I think there's sort of a stigma around mental health, especially for guys. Um, and I think my personal mission within that is to sort of help with that stigma and to let people know that it's all, it's all right to talk about these things. And that starts at the top. It's so important that leadership set the tone and that they lead by example. When we launched Trust, we were really pleased that our president attended our launch event and in doing so, surprised us all in the room by sharing a deeply personal story about something that they were going through at the time. I think what that showed us is that no one's invincible. Mental health challenges happen to everybody and that trickle-down effect is really important because it fosters this sense of empathy because if your manager is open about their mental health and challenges, then if somebody's struggling in the team, I would hope that they feel more comfortable raising their hand, you know, having a conversation with their manager and feeling that you know, they're going to get some support because it takes a huge amount of strength to to make that move. But having the confidence to have that conversation also depends on feeling connected and comfortable with the people around you. Inclusivity and diversity, right? It's, it's not just saying, hey, we're all the same. It's also saying, hey, we're all different and, and celebrating those differences and enabling people to kind of bring their authentic selves to work is a really big part of what we want to achieve. But I also think it's very important to work intersectionally with the other Bergs. So our business resource groups include trust, of course, pride, we also have women at Disney, uh, diversity who look at issues of race and religion, and also enabled who are our Berg who deal with disabilities or different abilities. And I find it's very useful to kind of work together with them because what we share is a difference. And by bringing your differences to work, you, you think about what unites us more. And creating a network of mental health first aiders is helping Disney's cast members support one another. We've had 450 of our cast members already go through the training on the programme and that includes all of our UK leadership team, which is great. I think having mental first aiders around the building and having so many of them is really important. Just having somebody that you can have a chat to, who will listen, who can then help signpost 
you to maybe it's our wellness hub where we've got tons of resources or can actually just be a buddy and be a good ear and sometimes that's all it takes. Creating a sense of belonging. Ultimately we're a business that has consumers attached to it and our consumers are every colour, every creed, every shape, every gender, every sexuality and until you feel represented you don't feel part of the party. A simple but important message, helping one of the world's most recognised brands look after the mental health and well-being of everyone in its corporate family. Being more open about mental health, being more aware that people might be struggling in silence and we don't know it, creating those safe spaces where people can talk about mental health, listening about it, keeping it on the agenda, leadership, talking openly, being honest about their challenges, all of that creates or helps to foster a more inclusive culture, which is so important for us at Disney. Anyone can play their part in supporting the mental health of those they come into contact with each and every day. We met Mental Health UK and some of their partnering companies to discuss the role of businesses in improving mental health throughout all walks of society. You may not always be able to spot a mental health problem, but millions of people feel it. Charity Mental Health UK have partnered up with businesses to encourage them to play their part in striving to create a society with better mental health at its heart. We're a charity that's really here for everybody, whether it's people wanting to understand how to protect and maintain their mental health, but also for people who might be experiencing problems with their mental health for the first time or experiencing some levels of crisis as well. Businesses don't exist in silo, they don't exist in a vacuum. They'll have customers, they'll have supply chains, they'll have a really large footprint within their local community. And for us, I think it's about taking that little extra step further. And Mental Health UK have been laying down the basics for a variety of organisations, offering training, practical advice, signs to look out for and guidance to reach out to employees and customers that may be experiencing poor mental health. When it comes to working with an organisation, getting the foundations right is the most important thing. So understanding that mental health is something that we all have. And then I think it comes down to three things. It comes down to thinking about people's behaviours, policies that an organisation operates with, and then the way it goes about its practice. One company building on the success of their relationship with Mental Health UK is ISG. They've been leading the charge to change the mental health culture in construction. Well, it's the biggest killer in our industry, so um, you know that's that's the hard fact. Yet the industry has focused on safety around physical safety, so we really had to rebalance that with mental safety and mental well-being. Richard says they've seen a real difference in morale after teaming up with Mental Health UK. They've done everything from training our people in mental resilience, training our uh, mental health first aiders. Um, they've given us advice on things we could do on site. This was the article a couple of years ago where we announced the partnership with Mental Health UK. The range of businesses Mental Health UK work with is vast. Innovation Broking, an insurance broker who look after a large number of care providers, say the mental health of their clients and in turn their customers is critical for any successful business. A lot of the care providers were really struggling um, to fulfil their staffing needs, so making sure that staff were coming to work and staying there and being happy was really important to them. We embarked on a, a regime of training courses. We get a number of managers or senior leaders at our clients. They'll come along for the training course and then we upskill them on mental health techniques so they understand mental health better and they can look out for those signs. Mental Health UK have been acutely aware of the increasing financial pressures that people are under. In collaboration with Lloyd's Banking Group, they set up the Mental Health Money Advice Service, which has proved to be a lifeline. I think it's the only UK-wide service that helps people with both mental health and money worries. Um, I think so far over 2 million people have accessed their online support services. And I think over 5,000 people have actually managed to get their finances back on track through using the specialist helpline. 
And Lloyds Banking Group has taken Mental Health UK's mantra even further, ensuring not only their customers' mental health needs are met, but the well-being of their staff too. Though we're a bank, we're a bank made up of over 60,000 individual colleagues who are also everyday people <laughs> from around the UK. And so on average, someone with a mental health condition is three and a half times more likely to be in um, financial difficulty or have problem debt. And therefore it's important for us as a bank to help those customers because the problem debt is a problem for them, but it's also a problem for us. If I had one hope for the future, it would be that organisations do just take that time to think about how they might be able to do just those little things differently and bring their staff on the journey that could make a huge difference to people's lives. A better understanding of mental health conditions means everyone can exercise more empathy for those experiencing poor mental health and make a real difference to someone's, anyone's day. Thank you for watching Play Your Part. All our interviews and reports are available on the Mental Health UK website. The details are on the screen now. From me and the team at ITN Business, thank you for watching and goodbye.